Hello and welcome to the panel to this panel discussion on the subject of Trimeki and data centers knowledge exchange. We will try to address the engineering challenges in critical environments. We are expecting a great turnout today. The lecture will be recorded and will be made available later along with the presentation slides. I am Murat Islam. I am a member of the Process Industries Division Northwest Center and Fiona Wong from the IMAKI events team will be managing the event broadcast for us. This panel discussion will provide us an opportunity for information exchange with those in operational roles in data centers. I was certainly surprised by what I have heard so far about this sector regarding the mechanical engineering career opportunities, so I really hope that you will enjoy the discussions. Please use the Ask a Question button to submit your questions throughout the event, and we will endeavor to direct them to our panel later. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Emma Fryer and Steve Wright, who will introduce our panelists and moderate this discussion. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much, uh, Murat. I'm Emma Fryer, and I look after the UK data center sector for Tech UK. Tech UK is a broad-based technology industry association. Um, and I provide really a collective voice for the industry. I speak on their behalf for government um, and I, I really look after things like policy, compliance and reputation. Um, and I do not operate a data centre, so I'm probably the odd one out here. Um, but I wanted to really give you a little bit of a backstory on the sector just before I hand over to Steve and our panellists. So um, I just move you through um, the slides here. I've got... Uh, here we go. So firstly, I just wanted to highlight what is a data center. And I suppose simplistically, a data center is where the internet lives. It's a secure facility to house computing equipment. It's a controlled environment with high connectivity. And that may not mean all that much to certain people, but really um, it's a way of um, consolidating IT functions into purpose-built, secure, efficient facilities. So what you might have seen traditionally is called distributed IT, where servers sit in premises in cupboards and closets. Um, the UK data centre pulls that all together into purpose-built facilities. And actually, um, the UK data centre, not, not very well known to people, but is, is globally important. It's market leading. It's the largest commercial data centre in Europe with over 200 facilities. Um, we probably have the same number again of slightly, albeit smaller facilities um, supporting enterprise operations, so in-house data centres. Um, and then there's lots of this uh, distributed IT, which is gradually migrating and consolidating over time, but that's taking a while. Um, lots of myths around data centers. There are no data centers in the UK is one of them. They're all in Iceland, We've got plenty here. And also the other common myth is that we don't need data centers because now we have the cloud. Um, so hopefully we'll dispel a couple of those uh, during the session. Um, I suppose really as well, I need to say why they matter. So what do they do within the economy? Um, and data centers do underpin our modern digital economy. Um, as the image suggests, um, it's every aspect of digital living, business processes, government services, social interactions. They enable space travel, artificial intelligence, machine to machine communications. They sit behind YouTube, Spotify, Netflix, Facebook, all the things you've heard of. <laughs> um, and they're where, you know, things like Formula One is lost and, and won. They're behind broadcast, they enable smart grid, they provide the processing power for bioinformatics and medical research, been very important recently, um, and they allow us to model and understand our planet, its atmosphere from weather forecasting to climate change. So we think they're quite important. Um, then I'm just going to run through a couple of slides about how they evolved. So this is um, data center backstory, and it goes back actually to 1837 with Babbage's um, difference engine. Um, then we had Morse and the electric telegraph from the 1830s onwards, culminating in, in, in undersea cables in about I think, the 1860s and 70s. And the famous punch card, perhaps less known, Herman Hollerith's punch card is at the bottom right. So those are the three things that allowed us um, to build the, the Internet. Um, and also, I just thought it's mentioning there was a proto-Internet um, set up by two people, I think in, in, in two Belgians, well, Otlet and Henri Lafontaine, uh, who wanted to create, a, it's called a Mundaneum, and it's a cross-reference system, everything about everything, a repository of knowledge. And then we got our own electronic version of that in 1989, thanks to Tim Berners-Lee. So I'm whizzing through this, but then um, now from up to 2020 suddenly, and we're looking at the outside of data centers, and I have to say that's not a realistic interpretation of the web, but just to show that is 
um, now a modern day data centre. I think that one's in Amsterdam. I thought it was one of Billy's, but I'm not absolutely sure. Right. And then inside, um, state of the art server racks and an awful lot of wiring. And that's all supported by um, mechanical, mechanic, no, sorry, mechanical engineering. Um, so that's kind of the whistle stop tour of the background of data centres. A couple of things I just wanted to finish on before I hand over. Firstly, the fact the sector is actively growing. As we see this migration across from distributed IT and also the increased digitization of services and processes and um, society, um, demand for digital data is expanding and that means that we need that capacity in the data center um, or data infrastructure in the UK and elsewhere. So that's the sort of growth trend which is looking very healthy. Um, we need STEM skills, we need uh, new engineering qualified people coming into the sector um, to, to power that. Um, and then just finally, I think just addressing one of the myths um, in terms of who you think runs data centers in the UK. I've put up a bunch of um, logos for uh, data center, actually developers and operators and people who provide um, uh, services within the data center space. And I know you'll see some very familiar names in there. You'll see Amazon, you'll see BT, you'll see IBM, um, but you'll also see probably a number of names you haven't heard of, but they're very much there and, and the sector is to that extent um, populated by a lot of companies that you won't be familiar with. So part of this is introducing you to that community. Um, right, that's me. Sorry, I have barely drawn breath there. I'm going to hand over now to Steve, who will introduce our panel. I think I've got a slide. There we go. Right, over to you, Steve. Thanks, Emma, for that uh, fast-paced history of, uh, of information in the world, I guess. Um, so <laughs> I'm pleased to say we've got a great lineup of panelists today from, from the industry. Um, and they'll, they'll each be introducing themselves and giving you a bit, a bit of their background and how they've ended up working in the data center sector. I'm Steve Wright. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at 4D Data Centers. Um, we're a regional data center operator in the south. Um, and for, for my sins, I ended up in the, the data center sector after building really bad looking websites in the late 90s. Um, but that's progressed on to actually dealing with a lot of the back end um, infrastructure to support those websites over the last 20 years. Hopefully through this session, you'll um, be able to learn about some of the, the different elements of the the whole engineering process around the data center facilities. And obviously we'll be taking some specific looks into the mechanical side. And likewise, looking at some of the, the challenges we have from an engineering standpoint, as well as how we progress the industry um, and the future skills and experience we need. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So we have Mark, Billy, Dave, and Murat obviously has introduced himself already. Um, Mark, can I uh, pass over to you to give us a, a quick bit of your background and uh, how you've ended up in the data center sector? Indeed, yeah. Thanks, Steve, and uh, and good morning, everybody. So um, I basically started in in the world of IT. Uh, my actual degree was in geology, and I I was stuck on an oil rig in the North Sea, and um, sort of given a, a, a piece of IT equipment to, to manage and use with no real training and found I had a bit of a knack for it. So um, having been sort of dumped in the North Sea and then come back, you know, working happily as an IT guy, and then somebody put me in charge of a building, which was a bit of a shock. Um, so I got into a world of data centers really through the IT route and then um, actually managing the buildings, which is probably more familiar territory from, for, for most of you. Um, thereafter, I've managed a number of very large data centers and um, worked for a number of big brand names such as Dell and Intel and most recently CBRE um, and now operate as a, an independent consultant. So um, hopefully I advise others on how to do things rather than having to do anything useful myself. So that's me in a nutshell. Thanks, Mark. Who would have thought you'd uh, be able to move from uh, geological sciences into data centers? That's a great well, transition exactly of skills. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And Billy, I know you've got a, a very interesting background to share with us. I have indeed. Thanks, Steve. Good morning to everybody. Uh, my background is a bit more dramatic than Mark's is. I started off living on a farm in the early 70s moving to the Royal Navy and working in nuclear submarines. From that, I went into the construction industry and helped build the sizable B power station, again nuclear. 
And through that time, I progressed more and more towards an IT environment and become a service delivery manager for IT systems supporting asset management. When I eventually landed and finished that, I was looking for other opportunities and along came Equinix. And Equinix at that time in 2008 had 45 data centers globally. Uh, 15 of those were in Europe. So I jumped on board and ended up doing a myriad of all different types of activities. It was a steep learning curve, but it is all critical infrastructure. Through the, the time I've been with Equinix, we've gone from 45 data centers and a sort of $500 million company to what is now forecast to be a $6 billion company with over 210 data centers globally. And of that, we are in 54 different cities across the world. And my background is essentially looking after the engineering aspects of operations, focusing around mechanical and fire systems with a, a healthy respect for the environmental elements, working on a number of panels within the European Commission and supporting Tech UK in their dealings with government from a technical aspect. So it, it's been a long and varied career, and I've thoroughly enjoyed every step of it. It's been challenging, it's been exciting, and it's been rewarding. So thank you very much for listening to me, and back to you, Steve. That's great, Billy. And uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, I bet when you when you first went into the Navy, you weren't expecting me uh, having to manage buildings as opposed to submarines. <laughs> I didn't expect to manage submarines even. <laughs> <laughs> I went for the engineering, as we all do. And Dave, maybe you can uh, just give us a, a brief history of yourself. And uh, you know, obviously, I'm conscious that you're, you're part of Interaction, and which is part of a Digital Realty, one of uh, Billy's main competitors. But we have a healthy respect within the industry for our cross skills. We we, we do indeed. Yeah. Thanks, Steve, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've been in the industry for um, about 23 years now, and um, but again, had a had a, a bit of a strange or unusual route into the industry. Uh, I actually spent the first seven years of my career in uh, in manufacturing, um, automotive components uh, manufacturing. Um, my degree was actually in manufacturing engineering and um, started out um, up in a started my career up in a, a factory up in Lancaster as a uh, manufacturing project engineer um, for this. It was actually a global auto auto component supplier. Um, Started out as uh, very much on the shop floor, working with the maintenance guys, so learning how to uh, maintain and operate um, uh, equipment on the shop floor, manufacturing equipment, learn how to weld, operate machine tools. Basically, as a young graduate engineer, anything, I got the dirtiest jobs, as, as, as you can imagine. Anything that was uh, that was going that that got involved getting covered in soot or oil or whatever that that came to me. Um, then over five years, I was there, worked my way up to plant engineering manager. And uh, whilst I was doing that, um, I was lucky enough to be sponsored by the by the business to do a, a part time MBA uh, at Manchester Business School. Um, and then after graduating from that, moved to uh, the parent company in the US. Lived in the uh, in the US in uh, Indiana for a couple of years. But whilst whilst I was over in Indiana, um, uh, a colleague of mine from the uh, the MBA uh, cohort, a guy called Mike Kelly, who was the original founder of uh, Tally City. Um, who, who was at the time working at, um, at Manchester University in the National Computing Centre there. Um, but he decided that um, uh, co -location, commercial co-location data centres was going to be a big opportunity. So uh, basically he set that up uh, whilst I was over in the States. Um, he, he founded it in April 98 and made me an offer to come back uh, and join it in uh, September of 98. So um seemed like a good idea at the time to uh, go and try something else. Obviously, the internet was uh, the new big thing at the time. So I thought, great opportunity to get out of uh, the automotive manufacturing sector and go do something completely different. And um, of course, at that time, there was no uh, data center industry to speak of. Um, so if this was very much uh, a new business in a, a new and emerging uh, industry. So there were no um, you know, existing 
businesses for, from which you could recruit to to form a new business. So the background of a lot of people that were coming into it at that time were were very diverse. So myself, obviously, from uh, from manufacturing and people from all over. And it was quite a conscious decision of, uh, of Mike's at the time to bring bring that kind of diversity in um, to be uh, kind of agile and uh, and build a new business and a new industry and uh, you know and react to the market uh, the markets of the day the market of the day. Um, I know at the time there were a lot of people uh, being laid off from BT, so there was a there would have been, there was a big temptation to recruit a lot of ex BT people, but obviously that would have had cultural connotations. Uh, you, know, you wouldn't want to basically build something that was a, a cultural clone of uh, another big organisation. So it was very much uh, bringing together diversity in the early stages to build something new. Um, so that's how I got into it. Um, initially joined as um, operations manager in London. Um, as at the time they only had a uh, single site up in Manchester, uh, but I joined as the operations manager in London as so they got additional funding to uh, to build in London. Um, and then over 16 years at Telecity had uh, a range of roles, starting from operations manager, as I say, uh, then went on to manage the, uh, the European operations rollout in uh, the early 2000s, uh, became regional manager for Sweden, France, uh, Spain, and the rollout sites for a while. Um, then spent uh, about eight years as oper a central operations manager. So that was looking after uh, mechanical, electrical engineering, operational standards, operational management systems, KPIs, energy efficiency, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then for the last three years um, was a group energy and sustainability manager. Then left uh, Telecity to go and join a new startup in Manchester called Data Centered, uh, was operations director there for three years and then just over three years ago came to join uh, Digital Realty. Uh, Digital Realty is a very large uh, US-based organization just head headquartered in Austin, Texas, just moved uh, relocated head office from uh, San Francisco, uh, but a very large organization, um, you know, ch chasing Equinix, uh, as, as Billy says. Uh, we've got 290 DCs uh, globally, operate 24 countries, 49 metros, um, annual revenue is about three and a half billion dollars, um, so it's quite a large organisation. Um, my role there now is um, Director of Sustainability and Operational Risk uh, in, uh, in EMEA. So main focus areas are sustainability, which is a big issue for the industry nowadays, um, energy efficiency, um, um, energy procurement, uh, we spend a lot of money, money on energy as you can imagine, and also uh, compliance. So, uh, so that's that's me. Back to you, Steve. Thanks for that, Dave. So we've got a, quite a varied background across all our panelists, and um, I think it's always interesting to see that none of them actually started uh, within the IT sector. Um, we've all had various other disciplines that we've transferred over to, and that's really been driven by this 20-year or so rise of the the data center sector driven by the vast quantities of data that people are using nowadays, and also internet usage. So now I'd like to, to come on to some of the, the key components of, of what make up a data center. And the, there are probably four key areas which I'll generally touch on. There's the electrical side, our cooling systems, um, our security, and then our locations. So if we are, just skip into looking at, at the electricals at the high level. Maybe Billy, you can uh, talk us through one of the, the, the big considerations around uh, the electrical systems for data centers and those key components, which we're showing a few of there. Um, I'm conscious that we are talking to, to members of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, but I think providing a good overview of all those key components is important. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, so primarily, the objective is to make sure that the customer within a data center is always up, always alive. So we use the electrical energy from the utility. We then pass it through a UPS system backed up by the batteries, examples of which can be seen on the right-hand side of the slide there. And then that is fed to our customers. And they're looking for a 24-7, 365 level of security for their systems to operate in. On the left there, you'll recognize a Caterpillar generator. These are for backup systems that we are on the electrical side, and they help us 
to maintain in the event of a utility outage that electrical system to the customer. And they are standby generators. We hope that they never have to run, but we do test them periodically. And when they run, we expect them to maintain that level of resilience that the customer is looking for. So there will be, if we need two generators to maintain the, the active load, we probably have three. Some groups will have four uh, to maintain that and access through it. So they are the essential and fundamental components of the system. And they support our service level agreements to make sure that our customers are always happy. Thanks for that, Billy. And I think one of the, the things that you, you sort of managed to express there is the, the level of resilience we have to focus on in the data center sector to protect the critical functions of the IT services they deliver. Mark, could you uh, maybe just give us a, a flavor of other areas of critical and resilience design that we generally look at? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you know, Billy mentioned security and, and obviously physical security. So you'll find data centers tend to be very um, nondescript. They don't adver advertise themselves. Um, they're typically behind fairly large fences and, and typically have a, a, a relatively high element of security attached to actually even get into the site. Um, and then one of the one of the challenges we also face with data centers is that we we consume a lot of energy. So, um, as, as Billy described, you know, we, we, we pump a lot of energy into the IT systems that, uh, that, are, that are based in data centers. And generally speaking, that energy is converted to heat. So, one of the bigger challenges in data centers is not just su supporting the energy and making, that sh making sure that's delivered on a 24 by 7 basis, but actually also make sure that we can extract the heat that we generate from those buildings. Um, so the cooling systems also have to operate on a 24 by 7 basis, and they have to be capable of extracting the heat from what are effectively operating as incandescent light bulbs. You know, we, we put heat in, and, and, and the, the things that we're putting the heat into are relatively inefficient, um, and they generate an awful lot of heat, so we've got to extract that. So, so it's a fairly complex environment, and I think the one, the one thing I'd say about a data center building is it's, it's very, very different to probably most other buildings in the sense that it's not like an office block it's not like a retail um building it's it's it, it's a very different beast and what we're trying to do in data centers is keep it equipment happy rather than people so pe people we tend to try and keep out of data centers and we tend to you know operate data centers to look after the it equipment and as billy quite rightly said make sure that the services from those IT deployments are actually operational um, 365 days of the year. Hopefully that answers your question, Steve. Yeah, it did, Mark. And um, you touched on a, a really key element, which I think is going to be one of the, the areas of, of most interest for, for those on the webinar today. Um, the cooling systems that data centers are operating um, have really progressed over the tw last 20 years in terms of efficiency and the ways we approach cooling. But Dave, you know, when you when you first went in, into Telecity all those many years ago, um, could you maybe just sort of talk to some of the, the cooling systems that you're using then and, and how that has developed over the past few years to really drive the energy efficiency side and the changes we've seen? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's, um, yeah, so, I mean, an, an interesting uh, point, I mean, Mark was just talking about the, the buildings being very, very specific and uh, not like other buildings, which is which is very true. But back then, uh, and I'm talking late, uh, late 90s, um, you know, when, when the industry started, it was, it, it was a case of going out to find space wherever you could. So uh, I think a lot of the early data centers, and, and these are still operational in, uh, in, in the portfolios now. Uh, I know Equinix has them, we, we have them at Digital Realty. Uh, a lot of them out there, you know, are, are of that sort of uh, late 90s, early 2000s vintage, uh, and, and, and a lot of those are still in, in converted office spaces. Um, there were there were no existing large scale data centres, uh, the, the kind of which we build nowadays. So, um, so the cooling back in those days obviously was just what you could fit into. Um, you know, a, a, a space in an office building that you could convert into a plant area. Um, so uh, it was it was typically um, um, you know closed loop uh, chilled water systems. Um, so we had uh, you know chillers chillers outside typically, um, usually on the roof if we could find any roof space. Roof space roof space again was uh, was, was an issue. 
um, because you know office building roofs don't tend to be uh, particularly they don't need to be particularly structurally uh, strong um, so a lot of reinforcement work needed to convert those areas to be able to be able to actually carry the uh, the weight of the equipment that needed to be up there um, and uh, then within the buildings obviously we'd have to install um, chilled water pipe work and um, um, typically um, uh, cry units um, you know around the floors to provide the cooling and another another key point was that the power densities in those days were very much lower than they are now i think we were typically um, expecting around 300 watts per rack a third of a kilowatt a rack um, and a rack typically um, is a you know for those that aren't familiar with the uh, the terms in the industry uh, basically a, lot, a metal cabinet which houses all of the computer equipment um, typically about 60 millimeters by um, by about a meter, 1.2 meters, something like that, takes up roughly about two square meters of, of floor space. So quite a low power density. So that's what we were trying to build for in those days. But those, as over time, those power densities have increased dramatically. So the way that we uh, have have had to uh, deploy cooling to cope with that has has also had to change quite a lot as well. Um, uh, also, um, to, to Mark's point about uh, the laws of physics, where basically every um, transaction on a on, on a chip every transistor every time a transistor switches um, the uh, electrical energy is uh, consumed by it is converted directly into heat uh, and it's that heat that we have to deal with um, and given Moore's law the uh, as, uh, as the electronics has shrunk over time it's become much more much more power dense but um, it, I guess from a pure physics perspective essentially what we actually do is we take electrical energy into the buildings and we convert it all into heat um, and we have to deal with that heat and as over time that that, uh, that has increased the, the density of that's had to inc uh, increase dramatically in the way we've we've had to be much more creative about the way that we've uh, been dealing with that and um, obviously efficiency is a is a big issue now so uh, we need to put as little energy into the cooling system as possible to actually cool the kit down And Billy, in your time over the, the last 10 years, what sort of developments have you seen around the cooling systems um, that have been most notable in the changes that the, the sector has made in terms of driving that efficiency? Uh, well, certainly what we're seeing is the, the demand to reduce mechanical cooling to as much as possible. So there's been a lot of uh, discussion around fresh air cooling. I know Microsoft themselves have trialed that in a number of different ways, where they've just had the servers being fresh air cooled. It, it works to an extent, but it's not scalable to the, the sort of volume of how the business is growing. So we see that as a, a challenge. Uh, there's also a move away from the global warming potential F gases that are currently used, so they're trying to find alternatives. And there is even discussion about how we can best utilize the likes of ammonia chillers and use the heat from those and, and regenerate it. So that there is a lot of innovation being looked at as we look to a more sustainable future. The challenge we have with cooling systems is that they use a lot of the energy and we've got to try and optimize to minimize the, the use of them to bring that down so as that wherever we're putting into the data center is going into the compute workload and not the cooling workload. So there's a lot of drives and energy efficiency around that side. Uh, so it, it is a challenge and we work in partnership with the big vendors, the likes of Stoltz, Train, Vertiv and Airmec and others to try and support them in their development so that we can achieve greater efficiency for less energy consumption and have a more sustainable future. Great, thanks for that, Billy. Yeah, I think uh, certainly in, in my time looking over the industry, we've gone from using about for every kilowatt we use on IT, we'd use another kilowatt for cooling services and the such. Now we're, we're really seeing that efficiency, you know, as a, a tenfold um, decrease. So for every kilowatt we're putting into IT equipment, we're only using 100 watts in some facilities now that are really pushing the boundaries. And that's been great to see. 
Uh, and certainly what we've also seen is, in, and particularly in Amsterdam, <laughs> they use aquifiers as a means of helping that system. So they're taking, uh, drilling, boring a well that's in cold water, taking that cold water and passing it through and depositing it back in a, a, a hot well. And then through the winter months, they're taking the hot well, passing it back through to maintain the temperatures we're expecting and cooling it down and putting it back in the in the well. And the efficiency of that is that for every uh, 100 kilowatts of heat that we extract, we're using one kilowatt of power to do it. So that is one of the ways we're looking at. And we're looking at seeing if that technology can be adopted elsewhere across Europe. That's great, Billy. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. That was happening. That's uh, that's really pushing the boundaries, you know, for for every. Yeah. Steve, every just uh, just uh, another uh, another point on uh, the evolution of cooling systems and environmental impact. Um, over over the last few years, there has been uh, a move to use um, evaporative cooling, a lot more evaporative cooling, um, in yeah. quite innovative ways. Um, which is great because it just means that you're consuming a lot less energy in the, to run the cooling system, um, but you do consume water. And as the uh, the scale of data centers and de data center deployments have increased, obviously that's had a huge a huge impact on water consumption, which is now on everybody's radar. So that's now uh, that's now the big the big thing that everybody's focusing on, as well as as well as the energy. It's uh, it's not just energy; it's how, how much water has been consumed. So we're now trying to come up with new solutions that don't use water or use far less water. That's great, and that just shows a, a, a section of, which we'll come on to a bit later around the the energy efficiency and designing efficient solutions. I'd just like to come on to one of the the final areas of the the data center where we look at things around the physical and interior security of the buildings. So, Mark, um, maybe I could just bring you in on on some of the physical elements here that that we've got displayed on screen. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so first on the left, we've got uh, a fire suppression system. So, I think one of the uh, uh, one of the things that we, we we have to be very careful of in a data center, given that we we've got this twenty four by seven stroke three six five ambition, is is making sure that we don't set fire to things and and um, thereby obviously disrupt the continuity of the service from the IT platforms. So, so all data centers will have pretty sophisticated fire control systems, both. Um, to detect fire early, so we'll have VESTA systems, we'll have um, HSSD type systems, which are obviously there to detect fire or the potential for fire before it really takes hold. And then typically there'll be a relatively sophisticated uh, fire suppression system on the back of that, uh, either gaseous or sometimes water mist or some, some, some technology related to that, which really is intended to put out any kind of um, nascent fire before it really takes hold and, and hopefully keeps it to a, a very limited area. Um, once we move beyond the fire suppression, we get into biometric controls and access. So again, as, as I said earlier, access to a data center is, is very tightly controlled. Normally, people, there will be a pre-notification process. People will have to arrive with credentials, normally nationally issued ID, a passport, driving license, or something of that nature. They'll present that at a gatehouse. They will then go through um, a sequence of security measures, um, typical sort of onion skin type uh, securities, as we call it. So you've got multiple layers of security. Uh, the deeper you go, the more secure it, it, it is, in, at least in theory. And to control that, again, we've got some fairly sophisticated techniques. So you'll have the, the, the typical sort of pass card and pin type of exercise. But again, we've got the, the biometrics as a, highlighted in that central picture, which is a, obviously a fingerprint scanner. Um, but you'll see retinal scans, you'll see palm print scanners, um, you know, multiple different sorts of, of biometrics to uh, make sure the right people are gaining access and the wrong people are kept out. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we've got what is effectively a, a man trap. Um, so that's a revolving door. Uh, which basically allows somebody in, but may or may not allow them out, <laughs> depending on whether they should be there or not. Um, and, and in some cases, these even have uh, weight sensors, so they can 
not only read potentially biometrics or, or cards, etc., but can actually recognize A, whether you're in the right sort of weight area for the person who you're supposed to be. Um, but secondly, to make sure that you're not coming out with a whole bunch of things that you shouldn't have in your pockets. Um, uh, you know, I think a server is going to be fairly obvious, but um, IT equipment has some very expensive components in it, which people, you know, have in historically wandered off with. So um, again, the, you know, the, the security is very tightly controlled. You'll see a great deal of CCTV coverage in addition to these sorts of measures. Um, and again, what, what we effectively are supplying in the data center industry is, yes, we're supplying power. Yes, we're supplying cooling. Obviously, we're supplying space. But one of the big four elements that we're supplying is actually security as well. So um, again, it's, it's all about continuity of service. That, that's the key feature that we're all trying to uh, focus on. And Billy again, and hopefully David, that covers it. And Billy and Dave, is there anything else you'd like to add on to that? Well, there's, what we find a lot of it as well is a lot of our customers require that as a a mandate. Uh, we may have a financial exchange within our complex, so there are additional measures around that. Some of the customers may have very sensitive government data, or it may be that the under the GDPR, the data protection regulations, there are additional requirements. Uh, so all of these things are being mandated by our customers as a necessity. And it's very unusual to uh, attend the site and not uh, find that type of security system in place. Any final thoughts on that, Dave? Um, well, I guess uh, over over the years where these kind of protocols have developed, um, I mean, security was al was always a challenge for a, a variety of customers. It was always either uh, far too strict, and they and, and customers would find it problematic to access site in an ad hoc way that they liked, um, or it wasn't secure enough, which was uh, which was uh, you know a requirement from larger organisations. But I, I think over time. Um, different uh, approaches from different organizations effectively trying to satisfy the same customer base uh, we, we we've all kind of ended up in the same space now where these kind of approaches have become pretty standard um and to the point on standards there is the um there's a the, there's a, a an industry range of standards um en 5600 uh technical specifications for data spent data centers um security uh, is a big element within that and and, and that man you know that that uh, defines uh, a lot of these approaches as well. So it's very much become a standard approach. Um, but, you know, obviously with uh, with the current focus on um, uh, cyber security as well, that's another big aspect to it as well. But, uh, you know, make it basically physically making sure that only the right people are in the right parts of the data center at the right time is, is fairly critical. And uh, interestingly, over the COVID crisis, um, with uh, you know various government guidance, um, you know we, we'd, we'd actually found it quite easy to uh, to, uh, to to manage to COVID rules um, because we already had so much of the uh, the access control in place. Yeah, that's a good point. Great stuff. Well, at this stage, I'm gonna gonna just bring in a couple of questions that have come in uh, from from the audience as we've been going through this. So. The, the first one goes back to our discussions on the electrical side and the energy supply for data center and what's being done with regard to um, alternative sources, for example, fuel cells or the such. I'm not sure uh, who, who who would like to pick that one up on the panel. I'll, I'll take that one I, if I, I may, Steve. Uh, because one of the things that we are looking at is actively engaging with fuel cells uh, we've got facilities in Silicon Valley currently that have fuel cells as the primary source. But in addition to that, we're also looking at power purchase agreements where we are sourcing from solar and wind power uh, and, uh, and making those arrangements, putting them in place so that we provide the funding to add additionality to the grids and we guarantee to take the power produced from those sites and use it in our facilities. And majority of the data center operators now are looking for this 100% renewable energy uh, credit 
was that we're, we're making a difference to the, the environment and sustainability. So we have got plans to look further into the fuel cells and alternative other, alternative uh, products. Can, can I, if, if, if I can add to that, Steve, if I may, I think it's important to recognise that one of the challenges we've got in our industry is again, it's, it's service continuity. That's that's what it's all about. You know, that's what the day centre industry is ultimately about. Um, and so, for that, we need to have continuity of power. So, one of the challenges that we face with a lot of renewables, you know, be it wind, be it tidal, you know, some some, some of those sorts of or solar. Some of those sorts of uh, energy sources are, are obviously not constant. So we are challenged in our sector, both by the amount of energy that we need. Which, so we're very, very energy dense, probably a hundred times more energy dense than, than you know a typical building. Um, so that energy density pr provides its own challenges. So particularly f with with PV solutions, you know we just need such a huge acreage of, of PV to cover it. And then again the continuity. So. As Billy says, we are all actively looking at alternative energy sources, whether it's local generation on site using fuel cells or, or that sort of thing, or or other source of energy. But we we always come back to you know, is it actually economically viable and is it actually continuously available? Um, so they're the big challenges that we face. But I can absolutely guarantee there's a huge amount of, of work being done in this area to look at uh, all sorts of alternative options. Thanks for that. Um, we've had a couple of other questions come in. Obviously, we, we generate a lot of heat in the data center, and we've covered off some of the cooling sections about what we're doing with regard to any heat recovery or utilization of that waste heat um, that we generate. It's an interesting one, Steve, on that side, uh, because the waste heat that we generate is low grade. So we'd have to probably look at how we can make that more usable, uh, whether that's by installing heat pumps to bring the temperature up and apply to this heat, heating system. The other challenge we find with it is the locations where data centers are typically are in, in industrial parks now, and there's no direct linkage to either a district heating or a district cooling system to accomplish it. Uh, so the infrastructure isn't necessarily there to support it. We yeah. do, however, have a requirement by a lot of the authorities and municipalities that we build our facilities in to provide connectivity through a heat exchanger to our systems for the use of that heat. But to date, it's very seldom taken up. On the other side, we have in some of our facilities in place like Stockholm and Geneva, we are using uh, lake water or district cooling to help us and, and reduce this need for mechanical cooling to be used. So there are a lot of innovation around it and a lot of requirements to try and improve how effective we are and, and utilizing this heat. But typically the, the infrastructure required doesn't exist in the locations where we currently are. And one of the yeah. activities we're looking at going forward is how we can engage with governments or the European Union to push that agenda further forward so that it becomes more effective and we become uh, an added a value add to their district heating or district cooling systems. Mm, yeah. I think, yeah. I think again, to add, to add briefly to that, very, I, I know, Dave, you want to say something but i think that the challenge for us is it's I and mean, it's probably a bit of a misunderstanding you know can we recover heat from data centers yes we can it's not that we can't recover it and it's not that we can't we don't have that technology the 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 real challenge is though is finding a customer for that heat finding somebody who actually wants it um and to billy's point you know whether that's a district heating system or whatever or somebody else who wants it um it, it that is the problem can we do it mm. yes uh, is anybody going to pay us to do it or is anybody actually going to take advantage of it in, in most cases, no, not yet. Yeah. Um, my, my personal favourite is finding a brewery that wants to dry grain. Um, no, build a brewery <laughs> next to your data centre. You know, um, hasn't happened yet. It's just an idea. So if anybody who know, know a brewer who wants some cheap heat, off you go. <laughs> yeah. 
Indeed, yeah. Just, just to uh, just to emphasise the point about Scandinavia there, where you know that their 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 approach to city infrastructures is very much around district heating and cooling systems. So, uh, so, so the data centres that we have up there are you know relatively straightforward to to, to plug into that and make use of it and contribute to that as well, uh, which makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Um, and, and and yeah, and to Mark's point, it's 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 all very well building and uh, designing to be able to export the heat but you do have to have somewhere for it to go and uh, and that's the, that's the missing part of the puzzle at the moment but it, I, I think it's all also interesting to consider the rate at which you know when you think about the growth in data center deployments the move to edge data centers which are uh, which are likely to be smaller probably unmanned data centers that are going to exist uh, around city infrastructures uh, you know as we as as 5g um, develops uh, more fully and we have things like autonomous vehicles everything else that needs processing closer to the point of use rather than back calling everything back to centralized data centers so you are going to have much more of, of of that kind of infrastructure located in in you know in, in places that uh, it, it could be made much more use of. Plus, also if the density that the compute density goes up in those uh, areas as well, where they can make more use of uh, potentially um, immersion cooling or whatever, the heat that you get out of that is higher grade. So you have to put less energy into it to get useful heat out of it. So, so that's uh, that's probably something that's going to develop um, in, in in the future. And um, um, you know, well, yeah, I mean, you could even you could. One way of considering it is is, is that the amount of da data center and digital infrastructure that we have deployed at the moment, you know, if you fast forward 20 years, what we have now could be a bit of a drop in the ocean compared to what's going to be there in the future. So realistically, yeah. uh, whatever comes down the line has to be ready, you know, has to be integrated into the wider infrastructure in the communities. Yeah. That's great. And uh, hopefully that's answered a few of the questions that have come through. Um, just conscious uh, of time and uh, us moving this along a little bit. Um, so I think, interestingly, we're just touching on the data and we host a lot of data in data centers. Um, but actually, one of the, the things that we maybe haven't been as great at is generating our own data to make really important engineering decisions and also to mm. drive efficiencies. And on the screen that you can see at the present time is, is a, a data gathering technology which looks at the temperature of each of those racks throughout the data center. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe Mark, you can just speak to this a little bit um, and explain what's going on and how we're trying to integrate more information into the operations of a facility. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, so this really, th what this picture represents is is um, it, the temperature of of each of the cabinets. So, for those of you not familiar with the data center, the way we tend to organise IT equipment in data centres is to put them into standard sized cabinets or racks, as they're sometimes called, um, within the data center. And the idea is that we have an airflow through those cabinets, through the um, uh, through through the IT equipment. Uh, we put cold air in, in one side ideally uh, and there is a uh, a, a set of, uh, of sort of temperature envelopes uh, that we are uh, required to operate within to make sure the IT equipment is um, is properly cooled and then essentially the uh, the air will pass through that equipment come out of the backside as hot air and hopefully be extracted or removed into cooling units to be recirculated that's that's typically the way it works in very simple terms so what this this is showing is is the temperature of those individual cabinets um you know whether they're happy whether they're unhappy um you know blue dark blue probably means it's being slightly overcooled so we're, we're we're wasting a bit of energy by by putting too much cooling in there green is optimal we get into yellow and orange and even red that will show that actually the the cooling uh within that particular cabinet and within that equipment within the cabinet is actually not sufficient and therefore we need to you know change what we're doing and the way we're doing it so to, to steve's point what what this this tool will do is is collect data from a number of different points um both on those cabinets around the um around the data center hall itself uh, and very specifically in the um the cooling units the the downflow or uh crack units as are sometimes called uh, and and really try and balance the amount of energy that's being delivered in terms of the cooling and and the, and the cooling duty 
um, and match that against the requirements of the IT equipment across the floor in different areas. Um, and the challenge we face in the data center, again, a little bit un, uh, uh, different to building, uh, different to, um, buildings that are designed for people, is that the the deployment of the IT equip, equipment across the floor is not is not homogeneous. You know, there, there are there are areas of high density. Um, energy consumption and there are areas of low density. So getting the airflow correct, getting the, 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 the supply correct, getting the heat extraction correct, correct is quite a complicated business in, 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 in actual fact. And managing the airflow does require intelligence. It does require a, de a degree of prediction. So increasingly what we're seeing to Steve's point is, is tools that uh, A, assimilate the data, collect the data, B, process it, and then um, actually apply a set of logic, a set of rules to that data and determine the best way to manage the what is actually a very complex environment um, and an environment that's becoming too complex for humans to manage themselves. So yeah, you're absolutely right, Steve. You know, this, this, is, this, is, this area of, of IoT in terms of collecting data, um, analytics in terms of processing that data, and then smart knowledge-based systems to provide sensible answers is absolutely the way that data center management and and ultimately I think all building management is actually uh, is going so data centers may be um, slightly ahead of the curve but I'm sure this is going to happen in buildings generally just sorry does that does that does that cover it Steve that is perfect. That's great. So you still, um, still hear me? I, it's, it's all gone very quiet. I wasn't sure you were still with me. <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully everyone has, has managed to stick with us on, on this. And um, <laughs> I think interestingly, when you were touching on sort of the, those airflow requirements and how we're cooling the equipment and as we were touching on the energy efficiency area, one of the, the areas where we've seen is quite a lot of the, the IT side, so the server manufacturers and the such, working a lot more closely on with the, the mechanical engineering world in being able to adjust the temperatures that equipment can work in. So Mark, I'm not sure whether you could just uh, maybe speak to a little bit around sort of the, the ASHRAE standards and, and what this represents on this screen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm at a slight disadvantage because my screen has gone dark for some bizarre reason, but I'll try and keep talking anyway and, and, and guess, guess the slide that's up there. So, so yes, um, as, as Steve suggests, uh, we within the data center world um, basically adhere to a set of guidelines published by ASHRAE. So that's the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration um, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And so why is an American standard important? Well, the real reason is that ultimately they are the um, environmental envelopes to which the IT manufacturers have agreed to, com to comply and warrant their information in. So what we're really saying is that the, the way a data center is designed and operated from a cooling and humidity perspective is, is really down to the IT equipment that's in there. And that goes back to probably my statement earlier that these, these buildings are not really designed for humans, they're designed for IT equipment right down to the cooling. So what we have to do is operate within a set of parameters that are, again are defined through the by the IT manufacturers through ASHRAE. Um, they have recommended zones um, which are probably to some degree uh, legacy. So 18 to 27 degrees centigrade uh, Celsius sorry is is really the um, the recommended area that we should be operating in. This is the supply temperature that goes into the front of the servers, so the, the, the cool side of the server. Um, the servers take that in, they reject hot at the, at the back end of the server, they reject heat at the, out of the back. Um, so historically, we've always been required to supply cool air at the front of the, the cabinet or the server uh, between the range of 18 to 27 degrees Celsius. Um, the idea being that if we can elevate that temperature, the hotter we can supply air to the server and, 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 and maintain it in a happy state, uh, the less energy we're going to be consuming on mechanical cooling. Um, with that said, we are increasingly trying to move away from mechanical cooling, as, as both Dave and Billy suggested earlier, so going more towards you know, evaporative techniques or, or just using amb um, ambient air, so uh, ambient cold air. So, so uh, again, what ASHRAE does and why this is important is, is this defines the 
various envelopes at, at which the IT equipment is going to be happy. As you'll see, those, those envelopes expand through A1 to 2 to 3 to 4, um, increasingly wide envelopes of both um, temperature and humidity that IT equipment manufacturers will warrant their equipment within and therefore we can operate our data centers in wider temperature and humidity ranges, which typically results in less energy consumption on the cooling side. Um, so that's why ASHRAE is important, even though it's an American um, um, standard. So uh, I hope that covers it, Steve. Um, and I'm sure Dave and Billy can add more to it. Yeah, Dave and Billy, if you could... Uh... Just add any comments around sort of the efficiency programs you have going on and some of the engineering challenges that creates. That would be great. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, well, we all have uh, customer SLA service level agreements uh, around temperature and, and, and humidity. Um, and, I mean, ultimately, the objective of all of this is to um, put as little energy into the cooling system as possible, but still to be able to maintain the, uh, the, the, the the parameters within the, uh, the the bounds of the service level agreement, and that's really where uh, some of the innovations, like your previous slide, um, um, with, with that um, that uh, that software, which which was a graphic of um, it, which was basically a combination of wireless sensors, modelling, and intelligent optimization software, which effect which uses machine learning um, uh, to uh, to uh, help you minimize the amount of uh, energy that you're putting into the cooling system. And, and that, um, that that tool actually, it's, it's a graphic um, it, it, of a tool that we're using it. Uh, we ran a trial at one of our data centers uh, back in 2019, and uh, we actually ended up saving 20% of the cooling system energy consumption. We're now uh, ro rolling that out across uh, our other colo uh, data centers in Europe and across the US as well. Uh, based on the success of that uh, that trial, so um, there's a whole range of things that are being done. But ultimately, the objective is, you know, what your your, your target range is for every uh, single rack position. Um, you just want to put as little energy into the cooling system as possible to make sure that you're within that uh, within those parameters. Yeah. And Billy, any uh, final thoughts? Uh, the only final thought I have is that part and parcel of the problem is the IT equipment and its consumption of energy. So there's there's more and more of a burden on the manufacturers of that equipment to make it more efficient, to reduce energy consumption, to reduce the heat. So that is another side of the equation that needs to be considered. But as operators of data centers, we can only control what we have in control of, and that is the electrical and mechanical systems associated with it. So we've got to be flexible enough to deal with all points around the cooling and the technology that's being installed in our facilities. Thanks for that, Billy, Mark, and Dave. So I just want to come on to an element which I think will be of, of quite a bit of interest to um, our audience here about um, the, the kinds of skills um, and, and engineering challenges that are coming in the future and where you see inside your organizations in the sector, we're going to need to, to beef up a little bit. Obviously, we've been growing fast for the last 20 years um, and, you know, as shown by all of your diverse backgrounds, there is a lot of transferable skills from other sectors, um, even if it's not directly related. Um, so, Dave, maybe uh, maybe you can give me a view on both on the, the graduate side and you know people that are maybe looking to, to come over from other current sectors. Um, well, I think uh, you know as. Uh, as, as you've alluded to, the, there's, um, you know, the, the, the industry is growing rapidly and therefore needs more more people. Uh, a lot of uh, the people that have have grown, have grown up in the industry, uh, you know, are, get, are getting older, approaching retirement, and so on. So, so we need to do both, as you say. We need to we need to look at the graduates, attracting graduates to the industry, um, but also to bring people in from from other applicable industries where uh, there are a lot of uh, crossover skills. You know, so, you know, I've talked about my background in manufacturing, but other areas, there's obviously oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, you know, other other mission critical uh, services, uh, you know, operations management in, in those um, those kinds of areas is, uh, you know, is very much uh, 
you know part of uh, part of what we do um customer service skills as well it's uh, it's a very customer oriented business obviously so those are those are very much transferable skills um um plant facilities operations management sustainability engineering now as well uh, also you know as i say given the growth of uh, of the industry the increasing focus on it and the needs uh, for it to be uh, done in a much more sustainable way um that's now really a big emerging area within the industry so the whole whole aspects of uh, sustainability engineering um you know general um general backgrounds in industrial organization you know as i say that was manufacturing my manufacturing background was was quite relevant there uh, mechanical electrical systems design uh, is another is another big in, uh, big area maintenance management um, you know we've uh, we've talked about the criticality of the of the systems but the way in which they're managed and maintained is, is crucial so um you know the reason that, uh, that that we as a sector fortunately um have you know quite rare uh, issues uh, is because of the work and the planning that goes into all maintenance and engineering upgrade activities so um so that's uh, that's you know anything that's any background that is uh, in, in involves that kind of uh, thinking and approach process approach is uh, is, is quite key um so there's lots of applicable um work that goes on in other industries that would directly transfer across um with relatively you know at, at potentially at quite a senior level um well all levels really mm. um for people mid career um you know um a relatively short period of uh, of awareness building um to you know familiarize people with data centers and what goes on in data centers what they are etc you know that that could be a relatively short period of transition but then you know fundamentally the skills that people have built up over their careers would be you know very very relevant to to the industry and, and quite necessary and, and and also the um the, the the freshness of bringing uh, different approaches in is uh, you know is obviously something that helps uh, helps evolve the industry over time um so so that's key as, as well as uh, you know attracting the graduates the people in at a graduate level um to 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 sort of basically start you know build you know build their skill set from the uh, from the basic levels upwards and Billy, how do you see um, sort of our, our multidiscipline nature um, working for potentially other sectors or graduates? Uh, it, it's an interesting development and question in that as an organization at Equinix, we are working with the armed forces in a career transition pathway to bring people from that military background in. They're familiar with the critical services. We've already got arrangements in place with uh, organisations like the IET to do a career transition pathway. And last year, we recruited something like 17 people and put them through that pathway. And as Dave's already said, bringing this fresh talent into the data centre industry is helping us evolve and become more agile. We're being driven down a path of artificial intelligence, machine learning, but we need people that understand the engineering behind it to make sure that whoever's putting the code together actually understands what they're doing. So there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think in, across EMEA last year, we recruited almost a thousand people as the company has continued to grow. And we continue to grow at a, a, a rapid pace. So there's lots of opportunities and we look forward to having a diverse set of skills and backgrounds to help us evolve and become that a better organization and have that diversity. And the diverse inclusion belonging programs that we have in place allow us to evolve even faster and understand what people are looking for. Career paths are set up and people can come in as already alluded to, at that low level, or they can come in middle management, senior management, and, and bring with them their experiences, their skills to support the organizations. Yeah. And Mark, any, any further observations on what skills you think are, are gonna be key for us in the next few years? Yeah, I, I think I, I do, Steve. I think for, for me, I mean, obviously we're a very engineering led 
sector. You know, we, we, we require engineers of, of, of all sorts. As you say, you know, we are multidisciplinary. We, are, we, we require people on the, the mechanical side, the electrical side, the IT side. Um, and, and I think you know, very much a place for everybody in the sense that, you know, some engineers want to go down the innovation route and they, they want to be very much sort of leading edge and, 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 and develop new technologies and, 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 and put those new technologies into place. And I think there's this huge opportunity in the data center sector for that because we are, we're a 20 year old industry, maybe 25. You know, we are going through all sorts of innovative change. Some of that is being forced upon us because we, you know, we need to be more energy efficient and we conscious of our impact on the environment so tested earlier new energy sources new ways of cooling new ways of uh, using energy uh, reusing energy um, all very very important to us a huge amount of innovation but um, then equally we, we've, we've got the requirement to keep things running keep the lights on so we, we require those engineers who are very much uh, coming from that sort of critical engineering background with that you know the 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 culture of keeping the lights on the culture of of uh, you know service um very much the day-to-day -day operations and and there's a huge premium associated with that as well so we, we really do have something for everybody it doesn't really matter what engineering discipline you're involved in there will be a place in a data center and it doesn't really matter what your interest is in engineering whether it's again keeping the lights on and providing search continuity or whether it's really genuinely being at the bleeding edge of of, of engineering innovation uh, and, and coming up with new ideas and um, exploring new technologies absolutely something for everybody um, I think it's very much up to us in the data center sector to, uh, you know, stand up and be shouted and, um, you know, make sure that people are aware of us um, and, and uh, that there's a fantastic career path available here for, for everybody. You know, data centers aren't going away. We're going to be building more and more of them as a society, both from a business perspective and from a social perspective. We're increasingly using data centers, increasingly dependent on data centers. So it's a great career path for anybody to get into. It really is. Thanks for that, Mark. And I, uh, I'm conscious we're, we're overrunning by just a couple of minutes at the moment. So I just want to bring in a, a final couple of questions that have come in from the audience and then, then we'll wrap up. So we've had a really interesting question on um, the, the move potentially to immersion cooling. So placing the IT equipment into a mineral oil to get that direct fluid to heat transfer as opposed to um, using air. Um, Billy, is there, there much of that deployed in Equinix facilities? Uh, not as much as we'd like. Uh, we do have a, a number of customers who have that capability. Some are using the sort of mineral oil type base. Some are, are doing it as liquid cooling directly to the chips. Uh, so we have the capability to support it. But it still, unfortunately, uses the existing systems to extract the heat, however, however little that may be. So it, it, it is a challenge, and it is something that our customers need to look at more and more. But we have the capability within the facilities to accommodate that. It's just a question of what the customer demand is. And unfortunately, the traditional IT systems appear to be the commonplace uh, and it's specialist and you find that in the sort of high level compute for the likes of uh, CERN or other big research establishments, they have more of a demand for it than the average customer, whether that's a bank or a business. Uh, so it's a challenge, but we have the capability to deliver it when it's required. Yeah, from my observations over industry, it still seems quite quite on the, the bleeding edge. And I think yeah. there's a lot of experimentation yeah. going on. Um, but there's still, I'm still seeing uh, rather limited deployments of it. So I, I expect that will be an area that will grow over the next few years. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that will grow according to demand. At the moment, you know, uh, uh, the majority of cooling in, in the majority of data centers can be satisfied with air. Um, there are niche requirements, certainly for, for effective cooling for high density solutions like HPC, but um, there's, there's some way to go before it becomes commonplace. Great stuff. Okay, well, um, 
Murat, uh, thanks for hosting us today. It would be great to just get a, a bit of a, a few thoughts from yourself. I know we've only just really touched on that very top layer about the data center sector um, and some of the engineering challenges. And uh, yeah. hopefully it's been useful for everybody. Um, the, the slides will be shared and you can certainly get in touch with Emma to learn more and there's going to be some really useful links. But Murat, from, from that discussion with our, our panel of experts here, what are the main things you've, you think you've benefited from? Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this anyway in the first place. But uh, my, my main take out of this is um, I actually didn't realize there was so much mechanical engineering and uh, safety engineering, process engineering, operation engineering actually involved in the data centers. Um, there are so many different career paths available to mechanical engineers, so that, that was mm -hmm. a big take for me. Um, regarding engineering technical side, um, there is some opportunities there as well. Um, I am actually now willing to sort of, I'm now aware of the industry and I feel like I can now recommend this career path to the graduates that I'm sort of engaging with. Uh, the young members I'm engaging with. So that was a, that was a great thing, actually. So thank you very much for this uh, great panel discussion uh, and the great panel you brought forward. Thank you. Would you like me to close the event? Is that um, what you expected, Steve? Yep, I think uh, I think that brings us to the end of today. Apologies, we've overrun by ten minutes, but I think when you're in, in having a great discussion um, like we've had with the panelists here today, um, it's been really valuable to get all that variety of insight. Um, so, Murat, feel free to to close us out. Of course, yes. Um, obviously, we learned a lot about the data centers and sparked a lot of thoughts and uh, questions here, actually, and most of those actually couldn't be answered today. Uh, please do get in touch with your inquiries, and uh, I'm sure Emma Fryer, uh, who shared her contact details there, will be able to sort of direct you in the correct path. And thank you all very much for your attention, and we really hope you enjoyed this event. Uh, please explore our websites and jo join our discussions on social media as well. So thank you all very much.